we will give a good gift for those who bring the softest pillows tomorrow, inshallah. <laughs> Al-Fatiha. Before I begin, if we can get the brothers to please move forward because there is a lot of scattered space. So if you can make room, so as people come in, they can adjust right away. Thank you very much. Salla ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك وعلى أهل بيتك المظلومين صلى الله وسلم عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي وابن مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة ما خاب والله من تمسك بكم وأمنا من لجأ والتجأ إليكم يا ليتنا يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم وقوله الحق وهو أصدق الصادقين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن آياته أن خلق لكم من أنفسكم أزواجا لتسكنوا إليها وعليكم السلام وجعل بينكم مودة ورحمة Sween, you're gathering with a loud remembrance upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. As a gift to the soul of our beloved Sayyidi wa Mawlai Abi Abdullah al Hussein, recite the second salawat. To hasten the reappearance of Sayyidina wa Mawlana, Sahibul Asri wa Zaman, recite the third salawat with the loudest of your voices. <laughs> Amongst the most amazing and memorable times within the lives of human beings, is the pre-marriage period. A period where we are engaged in getting to know our significant other 
a period in which we experience a new chapter in our lives, a period full of love, joy, and tender feelings. And indeed, the pre-marriage period as the best period which allows one to put his guards down and become ready for that final commitment to commit to the actual marriage. And when two people choose to be married, they come together in order to experience companionship. And they come together in order to experience love, harmony, and joy. And to quench their thirst for those special feelings. And indeed, the best time for us to get to know one another is the time before marriage. However, the time before marriage can also become very deceiving. I remember a couple of years ago when I was in Florida, a young couple got introduced to the community. Several weeks later they came, they said, Sayyid, we'd like to get engaged. So they got engaged. And I believe weeks later, the girl came up to me and she said, Sayyid, I would like to truly thank you. I would like to thank you for allowing us to get to know one another. We're engaged and we are living the best days of our lives. In fact, she told me, I believe that I have found the man of my dream, an angel. He's humorous, he's generous, he is kind, he is compassionate. All the good things. I went to him and I said to him, what do you think of the period of engagement? He said, say it. How can I complain? This girl, I go to their house, she cooks the most delicious meals. She takes my shirts during the weekdays. She washes my shirts, she irons my shirts, she gives them to me in the weekends. She laughs at my jokes. She finds me to be attractive. She finds me to be humorous. I think I found the girl of my dream. And of course they got married. And after they got married for a while, I didn't see them. They went on honeymoons and starting uh, a new home. And I remember several months down the line, I got a phone call one day. Picked up the phone. And it was her. Assalamu alaikum, alaikum as salam. Sayyid, where are you? I said, Alhamdulillah, it's finally time for them to maybe invite me to their house, give me a gift, lunch, dinner, baraza. So I said, I'm in California, inshallah, I'll be back in a couple of days. She said, Sayyid, when will you be back exactly? I said, I'll be back on Thursday. She said, okay, Thursday morning we have to come to the masjid, we'd like to see you. I said, what is this in regards to? She said, we need some counseling, we need to speak to you. I said, okay. So as soon as they arrived through the door, they sat down, I looked at her, I said, my dear sister, tell me what's going on. She said, say it, in one word, he's the devil. I said to her, but a couple of months ago, you were telling me he's the man of your dream, he's an angel, today he's the devil? She said, say it, he's the devil. Why? She said, before when I would cook food, anything I put in front of him, he says, this is so delicious, this is so good, I love it. Now anything I put in front of him, he says, what is this? I don't like this food. Before when I would want to iron his clothes, he says, no, why you have to trouble yourself? You don't have to do this. Now he always tells me, why are my shirt ironed? Why aren't you doing the... The uh, work of the house, why aren't you doing this, why aren't you doing that? And he thinks of me as his own servant. I don't want to be his servant anymore. I can't see myself living with this guy. I said to him, what about you, brother? He said, say it. Before, anything I say, she would laugh, she would make me feel good. Now I go out with my friends, 
I crack jokes, she doesn't laugh at my jokes. She doesn't do anything in the house. She doesn't care about me and, you know, the usual. And fortunately, after the commitment of marriage, through the ups and downs of marriage, gaps are created between the husband and the wife. And this is completely normal. However, sometimes those gaps tend to grow and grow larger while people stay in the marriage. They endure the marriage. But the marriage no longer has any sort of significance in their lives. So for 40 years, 50 years, they're married. But doesn't mean anything. They say a guy took his wife to Jerusalem on the 50th anniversary. When he took his wife to Jerusalem on the 50th anniversary, there she died. She passed away. So they came to him, they said to him, listen, you can keep your wife in the Holy Land, bury her in the Holy Land. And it will only cost you a thousand dollars. But you can also choose to take her back to California. It will cost you about fifty to sixty thousand dollars. So he said, no, 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 please, I'd like to take her with me to California. So they said to him, this is very beautiful. After 60 years, 50, 60 years, you still want to take your wife back. But you know what? This is the holy land. This is sacred. And it costs you a lot less. He said, listen, Jesus died here and three days later he got resurrected. <laughs> so for 50 years, some people are married, but the marriage has no significance in their lives. And at times, no. Two months later, six months later, one year down the line, two years down the line, there is a divorce, an unfortunate divorce, which is extremely disliked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And studies show that children that come out of divorced families have emotional trouble throughout their entire life and they are more likely to have failed families and failed marriages themselves. And I said this in the first night that I came to this community this year. I said, I firmly believe that every community should take the mission statement of Imam Abu Abdullah al Hussein, write his mission statement, and the very interest, entrance of the Imam Barga, and the very entrance of the center, and the very ent- entrance of their community. Why? Because when I'm about to walk in and out of the building, I see the mission statement of Imam Hussein. I remind myself of the mission statement of Imam Hussein. I bring that mission statement within my life. And what is the mission statement of Imam Hussein? Inni lam akhruj ashiran wala batiran wala mufsida. I have not left for any worldly reasons. I've not left for the khilafah. I've not left for popularity. I've not left for fame. I've not left for power. بَلْ خَرَجْتْ لِإِصْلَاحِ أُمَّةِ جَدِّ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ But I've gone on this journey of sacrifice. For what? To perfect the ummah of my grandfather Rasulullah. And part of perfecting the ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam is to perfect our families. To perfect our families. Brothers and sisters, I can assure you today the greatest threat in the world, believe me, it is not the nuclear weapons. And it is not the economic, the economic situation. It is the lack of morality within the family. And unfortunately, we live in a society of divorce. We live in a society with broken families. In the year 2010, 2 million women aborted their children in this country. 2 million people. 2 million deaths, 2 million murders. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran says, this is the act of the jahiliyyah. 1,400 years ago when they would have baby girls born, they would marry them. What is the difference today? Whether this child is born or this child is not born. Abortion is an act of murder. وَإِذَا الْمَوْؤُودَةُ سُئِلَتْ وَإِذَا الْمَوْؤُودَةُ The baby, this baby that is aborted. And the day of judgment will rise. And it will ask, وَإِذَا الْمَوْؤُودَةُ 
سُئِلَتْ بِأَيِّ ذَنْبٍ قُتِلَتْ Why did you murder me? Why did you kill me? Two million people aborting their children in this country. And we live, I, where I come from, California, and where you live, New York, are the states of divorce. In California, divorce rate is 72%, and in this beautiful state, it is 75%. And we examine our community, and we find that there is no trouble in the pre-marriage period. MashaAllah, they don't have a problem and getting engaged. They don't have a problem in meeting one another. They don't have a problem in the engagement period. But the problems begin right after that commitment in marriage. And the very first thing that we have to do in our communities, and within the month of Ramadan, many people say, well, say it. This topic about family, we hear about it all the time. We have to dedicate at least one night to speak about our family in the 10 nights of Muharram. We have to dedicate at least one night to perfect our families in the school of Abu Abdullah al Hussein salawatullahi alayhi. That is why I have chosen to speak of verse 20 of Surah Al Rum tonight. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this verse introduces family and marriage in a completely different manner than many of us believe in. First of all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that marriage, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ Marriage and family is amongst Allah's signs, Allah's ayat. Therefore, Islam believes, listen to me please, Islam believes that marriage is an act of worship. Marriage is an act of worship. Just like salah, just like fasting, just like hajj, it's an act of worship. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, مَن تَزَوَّجَ فَقَدْ أَحْرَزَ نُصْفَ دِينِهِ Whoever marries, he has completed half of his faith. So indeed, it's a great act of worship. Al-Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq states, Rak'atan, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad al Two rak'ah performed by a married person is superior to Allah than 70 of a person that is not married. A great act of worship. Rasulullah states, whoever wishes to meet Allah as pure in the day of judgment, man arada an yalqa Allah tahiran min dhambi wa danas, falyulqi Allah bizawj. Then allow him to be resurrected as a married person in the day of judgment. So Islam gives a lot of importance to marriage. And let me ask you, in any act of worship in Islam, what is the most important element in that act of worship? What is it? Niya. Today if I stand here and I pray a hundred rak'ah without niya, will they be accepted? No. If I go to hajj and I wear the ihram and I perform the hajj and I pay my tour guide and I do everything, but I don't have a niya, the intention of hajj is not there. I don't have the niya for hajj. Does it count? No. Tomorrow wake up in the morning, don't eat anything until maghrib. Does it count as a fast? No. You need the niya. And this act of worship, we have not been taught that in this great act of worship, we need the niya. We need an intention. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless this marriage, where do we find the niya? We find the niya within the Holy Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I don't have time to speak about the entire verse, but we'll divide the verse into two segments. And we'll touch upon two segments of the verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Rum states, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa min ayatihi, an khalaq lakum min anfusikum azwajan litaskunu ilayha. He's created for you spouses from yourselves, so that you may seek tranquility from one another, so that you may become intimate. 
And at many times, there is no intimacy within the family, unfortunately. What do I mean by intimacy? Scholars of human behavior suggest that intimacy has five different levels. There are five levels of intimacy. First level is intellectual intimacy. What's intellectual intimacy? Or mental intimacy. When I wake up in the morning, as soon as I wake up, my thought process begins. So I think about, for example, taking a shower, having breakfast. I think about the fact I don't have time to take a shower. I don't have time to have breakfast. I need to rush to my office. I get to my office. I start, for example, prioritizing my work. Other thoughts, for example, I need to do my taxes. I need to, for example, call a family member. I need to ta take my car to the car wash. Those are all thoughts. We're constantly thinking during the day. And of course, the thought process continues until night. When we come home, we don't share those thoughts. And of course, if we don't share those thoughts, there isn't going to be mental intimacy with my partner. That is why studies show, it's very hot in here. Can we solve this problem, please? Or I'm going to have to take off my qaba. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. I know the brothers, please donate generously because the <laughs> another salawat, please. If I don't share those thoughts, then there isn't going to be any mental intimacy. And that is why studies show that at many times, people that we work with tend to know us better than our own spouse. Why? Because I spend nine hours, ten hours with this person in the office. I share my thoughts constantly with that person. So I constantly have mental and intellectual intimacy with the person that I work with. But when I go home, I don't share anything. That is a very big problem. Another type of mental intimacy or intellectual intimacy is for you to share things with your significant other. Not just with your significant other, with those who you love. So for example, if you're a medical doctor, you can share some of what you know. If you're an attorney, you may share some of what you know. If you're a teacher, you may share some of what you know. If you've read, for example, something about religion, you may share what you know. If you, for example, heard a lecture, you may share that with the members of your family and your significant other. If you've read, for example, an article about politics, politics, you can share that also with your significant other. There's nothing wrong with that. This is called intellectual intimacy. The second type of intimacy is emotional intimacy. What do I mean by emotional intimacy? Is when I share my emotions with those who I care for and those who care for me. For example, I tell my wife, I tell my children, I tell my parents, what is it that I like? And what is it that I dislike? What is it that encourages me? And what is it that for example, makes me sad? What is it that makes me upset? What is it that, for example, uh, I enjoy in life? And I also ask them, and even if we don't communicate on this level, then I try to learn that through their acts, through their body language, through spending time with them. Therefore, through the first two types of intimacy, our minds and our hearts become intimate. And those are the most important aspects of our existence. Third is spiritual intimacy, where we spiritually become intimate. At many times, such intimacy does not occur within many of the Islamic families. A Muslim family has to go through spiritual intimacy every single day. We wake up in the morning, let's do Fajr together. We can't do Fajr together, let's do Maghrib and Isha together. 
We can't do that. Then let us read a passage from the Quran together. Let us, for example, examine a passage from Nahj al Balagha. Let us hear a sermon. Let us read a hadith. Go to Umrah, go to Ziyarah, go to Hajj, go to a majlis together. Those are different levels of experiencing, so, uh, experiencing spiritual intimacy. That's the third type of intimacy. The fourth type of intimacy is social intimacy. What do I mean by social intimacy? At many times we find, especially young couples, experiencing a lot of difficulty in this department. For example, I come home and I tell my wife, listen, tonight we're going out for dinner with, for example, my friend Ali. Suddenly my wife, no, 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 I don't want to go with him. I don't want to go with that family. I don't like this family. I don't want to associate myself with this family. Or the opposite, for example, my wife tells me, this Sunday we're going to my cousin's house. No, I'm not going to your cousin's house. I don't want to associate with them. It's better that we discuss this. So I tell them, I tell my family members, my significant other, who is it that I like to associate with? Who is it that I enjoy associating myself with? Those type of people I really cannot become close to. Those type of people I'm willing to meet once, twice, three times a year. Those are my circle of friends. And she tells me of her circle of friends. So we discuss this when we have time, when we have a peace of mind, and we come to an agreement. Therefore, we won't run into such problems. And last is the physical intimacy. That starts with the mental intimacy. That starts with the emotional intimacy. That starts with the spiritual intimacy. That starts with the social and it is concluded by the physical intimacy. Therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا For you to become intimate. intimate. And that is the only way for us to go through all levels of intimacy to truly feel the significance of the ayah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً And Allah has placed mawadda amongst us. You all know the difference between mahabbah and mawadda. Mahabbah is love. Mawadda is for us to show our love, to demonstrate our love, to express our love. Many people come to me and say it, I work 12 hours a day, 10 hours a day, 6 days a week. I take my family on vacations every year. I buy them new clothes. I spend on them. I buy my wife so many gifts, jewelry, this, that. I buy her a new car. She doesn't care. It's as if I don't even do anything for them. She doesn't appreciate me. And of course, on the other hand, the wife will tell you, say it, he doesn't appreciate me. Because when he comes home, the house is clean, the food is on the table, everything that he's asked, I've done. So what, are, what does he expect from me? Scholars of human behavior suggest that every person has five different primary love languages. Listen to this. Recent studies show that sometimes, for example, when I work 10 hours a day and I buy my wife jewelry, and I expect her to really enjoy this jewelry, but yet she doesn't, that means I am indeed not communicating with her through her primary love language. If your husband comes home and the house is clean, and the food's on the table, that's good. But maybe that is not his primary love language. He expects to feel loved through other ways. And therefore, there would be a clash. That is why when we look to perfect our relationships, whether it is with my significant other, whether it is with my son, whether it is with my daughter, whether it is with my friends, my friends don't feel that I love them. They don't feel loved by me. Or I don't feel loved by them. My parents... My family members, I have to come and communicate with individuals through their own primary love language. 
What are the primary love languages? Number one, words of affirmation. What are words of affirmation? For me to speak kindly. For example, we read Hadith al kisa how many times a year? Thousand? Maybe. We hear. We hear at least a thousand times a year. And we, what we understand from Hadith al kisa is that Ahl al-Bayt have become pure through Hadith al kisa And Allah created the universe and everything within the universe for the sake of Ahl al-Bayt and everything else. But what is it that we tend to be forgetful when we examine Hadith al kisa is the way that the Prophet and Ahl al-Bayt speak to one another. Imam al-Hasan, a young boy, comes and says to his mother, Ya Ummah, إِنِّي أَجُدُ عِنْدَكِ رَائِحَةً طَيِّبَةً كَأَنَّهَا رَائِحَةُ جَدِّي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ Oh my beloved mother, I find a, a beautiful scent here. As if it is the scent of my grandfather, Rasulullah. Then he approaches his grandfather. Assalamu alayka ya jaddah. Assalamu alayka ya man ikhtarahu Allah. Atta'adhanu li an adkhula ma'aka tahta al kisa. He greets his grandfather with his titles. Then he asks him, Oh grandfather, do you allow me to enter the cloth? Now, Kids nowadays, you don't blame them, they're kids. Pick up the cloth, go under. Who's the grandpa? The grandpa doesn't mean anything. No. But look at the words of affirmation. Then look at how Rasulullah responds. وَعَلَيْكَ salam, يَا بُنَيَّ وَيَا حَبِيبِ وَيَا ثَمَرَةَ فُؤَادِي He speaks to him with the most kind and beautiful words. The same way he greets his Rasulullah would stand in front of the door of Fatima to Zahra. Only Fatima sometimes would be at the house. Only Fatima. He would stand in front of his own daughter's house and he would say, Assalamu alayka, Assalamu alaykum, ya ahla bayt al nubuwa. He would greet Fatima by stating, Fatima, you are ahl al bayt. He would stand and seek permission. Assalamu alaykum ya ahla bayt al nubuwa wa ma'dan al risala. Ata'adhanu li biddukhul. Do you allow me to enter? This is how he spoke to his daughter Fatima al Zahra. The way he spoke to his son in law Amir al Mu'mineen. The way he spoke to his grandchildren al Hassan wal Hussein. Those are words of affirmation. Amir al-Mu'mineen looks at his son, Imam Hassan. Imam Hassan's young. He says to him, Bunayya Hassan. Oh my beloved son, Hassan. Wajadtuka ba'di. I have found you to be part of my heart. Then he says, La wallah, bal wajadtuka kulli. He says, no by God, but I found you to be all my heart, all my existence. Now many of us, we tell our kids we love them in the phone call, you know. When we're finishing the conversation, I love it. This doesn't mean anything. That split second of me saying I love you doesn't mean anything. We have to actually talk to our significant other. We have to actually express our love for our children with words of affirmation. That's one way. Another way <coughs> that many parents need to keep in mind is the way they talk to the teenagers and the youth and their children in general. For example, I have a son, he's 16, 17 years old, and he likes to, for example, play football. Or he likes to, for example, play hockey, let's say. So one day I go and I watch him play, and he comes in the car and says, what is this, playing football? What's this going to get you? It's not going to get you anywhere. Besides, you're not even good. <laughs> that kid, Mike, he was so much better than you. Those destroy that self-esteem within the youth and within the children. It doesn't matter if he's good or he's not good. It doesn't matter if you like hockey or you don't like hockey. You have to tell your children as long as it is halal, as long as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is okay with it. Give them words of affirmation. 
support them, support their cause. And soon, like all the youth, they'll grow out of it. If your wife has cooked a meal and one day the meal is not the best of meals, it's okay for you to say this was a delicious meal. This was an awesome food. I loved it. You're the best cook. It's okay. They don't tax us on words. If, for example, your husband, the sisters that is, if your husband is, for example, a, an author and he wrote a book, even if nobody reads the book, even if it's a failed book, it's miserably failed, tell him, I read the book, it's a very good book, you're a very good author. If he's, for example, a teacher, tell him you're the best teacher. Tell him you're the best father, you're the best husband. Words of affirmation play a significant role in creating love within the home. The second primary love language is quality time. Quality time. For us to spend quality time with our family members. Don't say I don't have time. Because I, I can see everybody who says, I don't know. Business, work. The unfortunate scenario is sometimes when we procrastinate, we don't have time, we don't have time, we don't have time. Suddenly we have to put a lot of time. Suddenly we won't have time for anything else besides the misery we've created. Some people say, We'll say it every once a week, twice a week. I take my kids to the movies. I take my kids to the mall. I drive them to school every day. This is spending time in close proximity. It's not spending quality time. Go read the studies. Quality time is when I sit with the person that I choose to spend quality time with. Whether it's my wife. Whether it's my son, whether it's my daughter, whether it's my father, whether it's my uncle. And I spend quality time. My cell phone is turned off. I give them attention, undivided attention. I speak to them. I hear their emotions. And I cater to their feelings. That's called quality time. And believe me, that is missing in our families today. Especially the fathers. Especially the fathers. Those youngsters who are trying to build an emperor for themselves. The house is now treated as a five-star bed and breakfast. I show up at night, have the food, sleep in the morning, I have breakfast, shower, bye-bye. This is not it. The third primary love language is acts of service. What do I mean by acts of service? Sometimes I need to show people that I love them and I appreciate them through different acts. For example, I'm a very busy person, but yet I take out time to call my father. Father, do you need me to do anything for you? Do you need me to serve, do you need me to serve you in any way? And if he tells you, yes, I need you to, for example, do this for me. You drop everything. You do it. Because in that time, in that specific time, you will demonstrate your love for your father. Similarly, call your mother. Do you need anything? Your grandmother, your uncle, your aunts, your friends. Run errands for them. Serve them. Not only this is a primary love language, but look at the reward that Allah will give you, especially if it's your family members. And it's not your family members if it is a brother to you in faith. Allah says, if you run one errand for your brother in the dunya, if you solve one of his problems in the dunya, Allah will solve a thousand of your problems in the day of judgment. One of them is paradise. One of them is paradise. Let's take advantage of such times. Sometimes we always require our children to serve us. And that's how Allah says. Allah says, me, then your parents. So we serve our parents. But sometimes if the parents really need to show their love to their children, it's okay for you to engage in an act of service for them. Drive them, do something for them, help them in an assignment, help, help them with their business. Help them out, with, for example, in taking a vacation. This is called an act of service. 
And for some people, their primary love language is through acts of service. The fifth primary love language is receiving gifts. And I don't mean, you know, they have to be a million dollar check you give. Not that that would happen. I know it wouldn't happen. But, you know, sometimes you go on a small trip. You buy something very small. You say, I brought this for you from Karbala. I brought this for you from Mecca. I remembered you. I gave you the small gift. Some people truly bond with that gift. Even if it's a small card. Even if it's a flower. Even if it's something of... Financial insignificance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says when you go through all those five love languages, you will have love within the family. وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً And Imam Abu Abdullah al Hussein in the day of Ashura, communicated to Allah through all those love languages. If it was words of affirmation, look at his words. He sees his own son, Ali al-Akbar, murdered and slaughtered in front of him. Yet he raises his head to Allah <coughs> and he says, قَدْ حَوَّنَ مَا نَزَلَ بِي بِأَنَّهُ فِي عَيْنِ اللَّهِ Indeed, it gives me ease that I know you're watching. The continuous relationship. He sees Ali al Asghar murdered, he says the same thing. In the last moments where there was no one left to come to his rescue, what did he say? What did he say? He said to the swords and he said to the enemies, In kana deenu Muhammadin lam yastaqim. If the religion of Muhammad and the call of Allah has become weak, and if I have to give my blood in order to strengthen it, then all swords attack me. All swords attack me. This is what he gives. This is the way he speaks to Allah. And for many of us, we know Hussein in the 10th of Muharram. But go and read his dua in the day of Arafah. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. How Imam Hussein spoke to Allah. That dua explains the sacrifice of Hussein. Because the only way for me to explain how Hussein gave Ali al Akbar, Ali al Azgar, Abbas, his brothers, his companions, and he knew that his family is going to be taken as captives, is to say Hussein had unconditional love for Allah. He saw nothing besides Allah. That's what motivated him. That's what drove Hussein to do this. And that shows in his dua in the day of Arafah. Whether it's an act of service. Many people, brothers and sisters, I tell you we have to know their value in our community, the volunteers. Those behind the scenes. I arrive, I sit in the minbar, I give the speech, you arrive, we all leave. But there are some people that put in the time and the effort. Those are the people that are showing their acts of service for Allah and Imam Hussein. The people that walk all the way from Basra, all the way from Najaf, all the way from Baghdad to visit Hussein, they can also drive the car and go. They can also fly from Baghdad to Najaf. They can take the, the highway, but yet they decide they will walk for Imam Hussein. This is an act of service. And Imam Hussein, in the day of Ashura, gave the most beautiful flowers as gifts. Imam Hussein in the day of Ashura gave the most incredible human beings as gifts to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yesterday we spoke of Imam Hussein's arrival to Karbala. As soon as Imam Hussein arrived to Karbala, he was intercepted by a, by a man by the name of Hur ibn Yazid al riyahi Imam Hussein suddenly he stood up and he said, 
go and give them water. Not only give them, but give their cattle and their horses as well. Let them drink. Give them food. Be hospitable to them. Then Imam Hussein says to him, Hur, what is it that brings you? He said, Ya Aba Abdullah, I am here to take you. I am here to surround you and to take the bay'ah from you. Yet Imam Hussein continued to be kind to him, to be polite to him. And as the ninth of Muharram arrived, Hur ibn Yazid al Riyahi was in the tent of the enemies. He saw them drinking, he saw them partying, he saw them joyful. He went to Umar ibn Sa'd, he said, Ya Umar, Waihak, what are you about to do tomorrow morning? He said, Tomorrow morning we will kill Hussein and I will take his head to Ibn Ziyad. He said, seriously, you really want to do this? He said, yes. Hur then sat on the back of his horse. Allahu Akbar, how every year there will be Hur within every community. There will be people that had the, the past that we are not proud of, but they make that decision immediately that we want to be like Hur. We want to be Individuals that are remembered just like Hur is remembered. We want Allah's mercy just like Allah gave His mercy and compassion towards Hur. So Hur sat on the back of the horse and he went towards the camp of Abu Abdullah al Hussein. What did he see there? فَرَآهُمْ بَيْنَ رَاكِعٍ وَسَاجِدٍ وَتَالِيًا لِلْقُرْآنِ he saw them either reciting the Qur'an in ruku' or in sujood. He came immediately in front of the tent of Abu Abdullah al Hussein. He said to him, As-salamu alayk, Ya Sayyidi wa Ya Mawlai. يا أبا عبد الله. Let us all go to Abu Abdullah Al Hussein with her tonight. We say to him, يا سيدنا ومولانا. You don't know the significance of this statement every night. The significant, the significance of this sentence gives cure to the ill, and it gives your hajat. And it protects you until the following year where you will participate in the majalis of Imam Hussein. Ya Sayyidana wa Maulana Inna tawajjahna wa istashfa'na Wa tawassalna bika ila Allah Wa qaddamna ka bayna yaday hajatana All of us Ya wajihan inda Allah يا وجيها عند الله السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله. He said, "من أنت? Who is this?" He didn't say. He was ashamed to say, "I am حر." He said, "يا أبا عبد الله, أنا الذي جعجع بك الطريق." Oh, Ya Aba Abdullah, I am the man that intercepted your caravan. <clears throat> I am the man that's left you from escape and I've caused this misery. Ya Sayyidi, Halli min Tawba. Tawba, Tawba, huh? the most beautiful thing, the most beautiful element in our faith, Al Tawba. Aba Abdullah al-Hussein said to him, Tubtab Allahu alayk. 
For ask for forgiveness and Allah shall grant you that forgiveness. Now I want everyone in this majlis, the brothers, the sisters, the ya, everyone in this majlis three times. Raise your hands to Allah. And three times with Hurr ibn Yazid al-Riyahi. Ilahi al-Tawbah. Ilahi al-Tawbah. Ilahi al-Tawbah. Hur decided that he's going to sit on the back of the horse until Imam Hussein gives him permission to go and defend his cause. Amongst the first was Hur ibn Yazid al-Riyahi. He came to seek permission. Aba Abdullah gave him permission. Hur went and he fought and he fought bravely until he fell from the back of the horse stating Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. Aba Abdullah went to him, he put his head in his lap and he said, Ya Hur, oh Hur, you are a free man just like your mother named you. Meaning what? Meaning a free man is a man that comes out of the ignorance of the disobedience of Allah and enters into the freedom of the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But I say to him, Ya Mawlaya, Ya Sahib al-Zaman, Anta al-Mu'azza, Ya Sayyidi. Your grandfather went and he put the la, he put the head of Hur in his lap. But on the day of Ashura, when Hussein stood saying, Allah al min nasr yansuruna, Allah al min mu'in yu'inuna, who was there to come to the rescue of your grandfather Hussein? أسألك اللهم وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم الأعز الأجل الأكرم ten times with the loudest of your voices our hands raised to Allah سبحانه وتعالى يا الله يا الله يا الله يا الله يا رحمن يا رحيم <تصفيق> اللهم إنا نسألك بمحمد وعلي وفاطمة والحسن والحسين والتسعة المعصومين من ذرية الحسين O oh Allah forgive our sins shower on to us from your forgiveness O oh Allah, our parents, our grandparents, our relatives, friends, mu'mineen and mu'minat, those who have passed away from this community, shower onto their graves from your mercy and compassion. Hasten the reappearance of Mawlana Sahib al-Zaman. Every man and woman in this majlis with a haja, give them their hajat. Every man and mu'min, every mu'min and mu'min in this majlis with an illness, give them cure. O oh Allah, we ask you to grant us the visitation of Hussein, the shafa'ah of Hussein. O oh Allah, we ask you to bestow on to our families from your mercy and compassion. وَإِلَىٰ أَرْوَاحِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ وَالْعُلَمَاءِ وَالشُّهَدَاءَ الْفَاتِحَةَ مَعَ الصَّلَوَاتِ